absolutely everyone involved in this project, which has been carried out on a shoestring with the help of an enormous number of volunteers, over a thousand uh, volunteers, experts right across every part of the voluntary sector have given us their time and their effort uh, voluntarily. I'd like a special thank you to Richard, who, um, as director of this, uh, of this enterprise, has really kept us in line. He has pulled everything together in the most, well, the most impressive way, as you will see when you go online and uh, watch the report or, or look at it on your, on your memory stick. Um, it, is, it, it is really phenomenal, the effort that has gone into this. Somebody estimated at the meeting the other day that a decade of volunteering time Tot it all up has actually gone um, into this, and we have been fully aware of the of the enormity and the crucial importance of uh, of our task to produce a, a guide, a, a, a template, a sort of blueprint, which can get the whole sector onto the same responsive and responsible page. And uh, the you know I'd suggest that the transformational potential of our project is absolutely huge. Uh, some organizations are there. I think to get the balance right, we've had, we've had the attack from Michael Braid and you know, saying that, um, that, that a lot of charities aren't doing enough. I'd like to put it the other way around. I'd like to think that there are, relatively speaking, um, only a handful or so of charities that, aren't, that haven't changed the way that they operate in order to take on board all the criticism that came two years ago, starting with Oliver Cook. And, uh, I think there are a great many charities, a very foolish charity, that hasn't actually taken on board some of the points that were made at the time and some of the criticism that has come in, uh, that has come in since. What we have got has been crowdsourced by experts, as I said, but it has also been tested, beta tested, uh, over the last uh, couple of months. And thanks to everybody who was involved in that and giving us our feedback so that you not only had the input from a wide variety of experts, but, but then when we gave them our initial report, they were, they, they were doing some hard testing um, of that and we incorporated that in the final version of the report. So very, we very much hope that what we've got is a guidebook for the future that we have delivered to you. Uh, to give confidence to all donors by putting them absolutely in front of every single thing uh, that we do. And uh, I think our message for the fundraising preference service is that change is already happening and happening on a substantial scale. And if you just look at some of the examples on the fundraising regulator's own website, you've got charities like uh, Cancer Research, Macmillan, um, the RNLI, the RNLI incidentally, which is allowing for the fact it will lose 35 million pounds over the next five years because of the changes that it is putting into place. But the long-term prospects are much, much better because you take on board your donors in, in, in get them involved in a much more interesting way. And uh, at the end of the day, to have happy, contented donors will long-term actually bring on board more fundraising to make up for what might be for some charities that uh, initial um, shortfall. So uh, the fundraising preference service is addressing symptoms. We are addressing the cause in a very, very detailed, web, detailed way. And although we might have 526 recommendations and ideas and thoughts, every individual charity will not need to take on board all of them by any means, but you would cherry pick those bits of advice that we hope will be um, sensible for you and to help you put the donor right at the heart of the experience. So thanks very much indeed and I will hand over to, to Kath. You know, when I walked in it's not how are you but stick to time. So I'm going to be really focused here and, and you've got, you're going to hear from lots of people. I'm delighted to be here to help to launch the outputs of the Donor Commission. Um, it's a brilliant thing to have been involved with. I am genuinely, truly inspired and awestruck by the scale of response from people. Um, in the fundraising community and across the voluntary sector. I often feel proud to be a fundraiser, but I have to say today I feel particularly proud. Um, people who've contributed their time and insight and generosity. I came into 
days. But what the Donor Commission outputs really help us to do, I think, is to put the donor front and centre of all, everything that we say and do and think about fundraising in our organisations, whether that's in the boardroom, absolutely critical, or uh, with our CEOs or leadership teams, or whether we're a fundraiser at any level in our organisation. Um, full of tips and advice, how to measure impact, how to hire great people, um, how to say thank you in ways that make people feel joyful. Um, it's a brilliant new resource. We know we are in a very competitive environment. People have lots and lots of choices about what they do with their money, which charity they give it to, or indeed whether they give it to charity at all, their hard-earned, hard-saved hands. We know that generally people stay in relationships if they feel loved and valued. So if we want to build communities um, of people who support us for life, I believe we absolutely have to focus on giving them the experience that they deserve. And to do that really well and consistently, I do think we need to change some of what we do and how we do it inside charities. There are some brilliant things happening, but some of the things for me, we need to always think about the language that we use and not lose <coughs> sight of the individual behind every gift, whether that's a big gift or a tiny one. We need to find new ways to measure impact, not just the financial ROI, but you know, how else can we measure donor satisfaction for some? We need to keep hiring great people. I see lots of them here, some of them in my team. Um, and then we need to train and develop them so that they can succeed. And we need to focus on making sure that every interaction we have with a donor leaves them feeling better and happier than before they engage with us. It's pretty simple. We need to treat people as they would like to be treated. We are human beings persuading other human beings to join us and change the world. And I think the Commission gives us the tools to make that just a little bit easier. Thank you. Which I find myself putting on almost a daily basis at the moment. Knowledge is like paint. It's absolutely no good until it's applied. I've been a fundraiser for just over 10, 11 years now. And in every single job that I've had, I've had donor experience in either my job title or in my job description. Uh, prior to donor experience coming into trend, it was stewardship, but um, fairly the same thing. So, from a ground level, I know exactly how true that quote is and how hard it is to apply um, that knowledge. Especially when you're a fundraiser who, like most fundraisers, are generally doing two and a half people's jobs on half a, people's, half a person's salary <laughs> and with a myriad of things being thrown at you, not least um, hitting target at the end of the year. So half the battle is knowing where to start, and the second half of the battle is knowing what to do. Along with that, I've also, over the last 10 years, experienced a, a nice healthy side of changing mindset, which always seems to get in the way. I thought I was in the minority, and that everyone else had either got it right or, or didn't care. But when I started working with of working for the Commission, I experienced literally hundreds of fundraisers, just like me, who put their hands up and put their time in to produce what can only be described as an amazing resource for the fundraising community. And I should know, I've read the whole thing about three times over. It's an absolutely brilliant starting point for the practical application of ideas and theories to improve the donor experience. For fundraisers, it's a big, big, big black box of ideas with direction, support, signposts. <coughs> so that tactical, practical and strategic change can be made that little bit easier. For senior managers and our leaders, it puts an awful lot into context and it gives the information so that they can be reassured and confident that leading the donor-centred fundraising function is the right thing to do. It's going to really help with that mindset change. And most importantly, for donors who continue to give generously, it's going to improve their experience and make it into exactly what it should be, a joy to be given, which is only ever going to be good for our beneficiaries. There is some amazing work going on in the sector already, and I'm personally very lucky and proud to be working with a number of organisations who are doing some, quite frankly, transformational things um, in their area of donor experience. But it brings me on to one of my personal passions, which the Commission sings to. And 
and that's that not every charity has big teams, big budgets, and boards, agencies, and external expertise. And the donation report is applicable to every charity of any size and any fundraiser who works within them. So if I could go back 10, 11 years, pick up the report of the Commission and get into a TARDIS, which I'd quite like to do actually, <laughs> um, I think I would actually spend less time trying to change people's minds and, and kind of um, struggling with getting that practical application and more time being more effective and improving that donor experience in a much more effective way. Just finally, the most exciting thing about this report is it's not the finish of a report, it's the start. And I'm really pleased that the Institute of Fundraising is taking it over. Because to quote the late great Tony Elisha, the first time I came into contact with him, he said the world is changing at an unprecedented rate. And he was right. And this report isn't something that should stand still, it's something that should gain momentum. And I've got a fantastic job. I help to change children's lives with our supporters through the Children's Society. And I'm here today to share a story about uh, one of the courses I worked for Children's Society, which was, which was Friends of the Earth. And I'm sharing the story because I'm really pleased to be here as part of the Commission of Donor Experience. Uh, because it's a great body of work, but it's a huge body of work. It's over 500 recommendations that, that have come out, and that can feel quite daunting and overwhelming. But I'm absolutely convinced that at its heart, it's about culture, mindset, and getting the basics right. And I think that is a simple job that, that any of us can do. So I was at Friends of the Earth back in 2015. And we started that year in a, in a really optimistic frame of mind, uh, because we were committed to putting supporters at the heart of what we did, and we thought we could do that really, really well. And at the start of the year, we spent two whole days as an entire organisation talking about nothing but who are our supporters, what do they care about, and how can we give them a better experience so we can change the world a bit quicker and a bit easier. And then uh, a lot of stuff happened. Uh, we saw the explosion in the media, we saw unprecedented political scrutiny, we saw suddenly a completely different narrative to the one we were used to. Instead of people championing fundraising and charities, suddenly people were challenging us. And the incident, I think, for a lot of us in the sector was initially, well, what, what do we do? And should we keep our head down and hope that no one names us as one of the bad guys? But at Friends of the Earth, because we'd realised that actually our mindset was about well, what do our supporters think, well the right thing to do wasn't to keep our head down, it was to get in touch with them and ask them, what do you think? What do you feel? Are we getting things right? And so we did a really simple thing, we wrote a letter. We wrote a letter to every single one of our supporters, and that's what we said, are we getting things right? What's the experience like? What can we do better? And we were absolutely overwhelmed at the response we got. Thousands upon thousands of supporters all wrote back, most of them in handwritten form, which took us quite a while to then read them, uh, but thousands of replies. And it was really inspiring. We heard amazing stories about the motivation of our supporters and the great experience they were having. But we also had our eyes opened. We had our eyes opened because a number of them said to us, how refreshing to be asked, but never been asked before. And actually, now that you ask, there are some things we think you could do differently. And as a result of that, we started to do things differently. And now, several years later, I've moved on, but when I get back in touch with people, friends of the air, they tell me that the organisation now thinks completely differently. That the supporter is in the room in every conversation, from board level meetings to every uh, discussion about what's the next thing that we should send and is it the right thing to send. And the reason I think that the organisation did well, and I think the reason that the Friends of the Earth responded in the right way, was just that mindset. It was just that culture of thinking, not about what does this mean for our reputation, what does it mean for our bottom line, but what does it mean for our supporters. And if there's one thing that I think we can all take out of the Commission, it's practical advice about how we can put the supporters' mindset first, and therefore get them. <coughs> Thank you very much. Well, the people with are never left out of line. And I do that by raising money to support the charity that I work for, Gold Dogs. Um, my story is going to be one of a donor and um, how she has, in a period of 18 months, gone from being a stranger to being one of our best friends. Um, why is this work important? Why is the Donor Commission work important? Because it's about trust, as so many people have said because it's about um, public confidence in charities. Um, most important, it's about our future sustainability. Um, we owe the future generations of beneficiaries this 
piece of work. Um, so, to start my story, um, I use a cliche which is people may forget your name, they may forget what you said to them, but they won't forget how you made them feel. And this is very, very pertinent to the story that I'm going to tell you. So, 18 months ago, roughly, um, I call it Deirdre, was signed up by one of our in house face to face fundraisers <coughs> in, in Kent. And um, following our face to face fundraising um, interactions, we always give every single donor a welcome call. And we do that for a number of reasons. The first, obviously, is to welcome them to our tribe. The second is to check that the experience was good and that they didn't feel as though they were pressurising the face-to-face -face experience wasn't an unpleasant, an unpleasant one. Um, and also, of course, in this day and age, we're checking that she wants to stay in touch with her. Welcome call, which was very positive. Um, we always send our donors a welcome pack and in the Sponsor a Puppy programme that consists of a fridge magnet of a dog, in this case called Fifi, I didn't choose that one, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and about how, about the journey that, um, that our donor was going to come on with us, the start of an incredible journey. Um, because she had given us an indication that um, she was interested in supporting us in other ways, she would have then received um, our legacy mailing pack. Um, she indicated on there that this would be something she would consider doing. Um, and this would have all happened before she got her first pup date. Now, a pup date does what it says on the tin. It informs the donor about the progress of their dog in training um, and how they're getting on. And that's written by um, a volunteer at Guide Dogs that we call a puppy walker. Um, so it's a very authentic piece of um, communication. Um, she then would have um, had a legacy call to make sure that the information she had give us, uh, given us still stood. And then she would have had a second pup date. So kind of like six or seven month cycle that I've just described so far. With all of these um, mailings, we start with the two magic words that I, um, I've been listening to Ken for next week for about 25 years now. Um, and, he, he's still, he's still going. <laughs> and he's never said anything different. And that is... <laughs> Okay. 
forward to becoming a fully signed up um, legacy um, pledger. And um, I'm pleased to say that that's now the situation. So in 18 months, from stranger to best friend is where she's at. But in her words, um, much more important than anything I could say, she describes it. Um, I am an active widow. I am grateful I have my sight and the freedom it gives me. I've had cataracts, um, and with um, thank heavens, they've now been. Um, uh, I've now had an operation, and I can see properly again. But it brought home to me um, just how scary blindness was. I have no family, and being part of the amazing work of guide dogs brings me comfort, fulfilment and a sense of belonging. Guide dogs is my charity now. So that's the words of a satisfied donor. That's what this work is all about. We owe it to future generations of donors and of beneficiaries to get this right. Definitive evidence? No. If you don't believe it's self-evident, you shouldn't be here today. Therefore, the whole purpose of the Commission is to turn our thinking through 90 degrees. From thinking about the needs of the charity to thinking about the needs of the donor. What motivates her? What inspires her? What are her needs and wants? What is she not like? We believe that if you start with the donor, you will raise more money and help more beneficiaries. This is a profound change. As has been said, the scale of our outputs is daunting. 300 contributors, 6 P's, 28 project summaries, each with battling documents, with case studies, and much detail. In total, adding up to 526 recommendations, 250 case studies. Yet we hope you will find our output navigable. What is our wrong call to action? That over time, each and every charity makes a promise to its donors. The raw material for that is all in our outputs. Creating that promise for each charity should involve fundraisers, their directors, CEOs and trustees together, arguing and debating, and creating something that will be unique for each charity, reflecting your cause, your size, your approach, who your donors are, what is internally possible, and what might be possible if you adapt, and what you believe. The very process of doing that will bring thinking about donors to the fore throughout the charity. And then having reached something that everyone in the charity is committed to, telling your donors, to engage them, to motivate them, to show them that you treasure them, to make them feel good about supporting you, to make them feel they want to continue to support you more and for longer, because you have told them that they are how you are able to do the work that you do. I repeat what I said at the beginning. Our aim is to transform fundraising, to change the culture to a truly consistent, donor-based approach to raising money. We really can do it. The Commission's outputs are rich in ways to do it. One of our speakers, um, I would like to underline what Giles has just said, and that the, the challenge for charities is what new promise will you make to donors? And I think it's encapsulated that so well. What I wanted to do is just to say, well, what does that look and feel like when it's done, when it's done well? And some of you were, perhaps were here yesterday afternoon for the Meet the Donor session and uh, one of the donors on the panel, Daphne, she talked about, she reflected on an experience that she had with one of the charities she, she supports. And it was really very simple. She received a letter uh, from, a, from a child sponsor, a sponsor she was, uh, sorry, a child she was sponsoring, and simply the letter said, thank you for loving me. And when Daphne said those words, thank you for loving me, simple words, she was moved to tears on the stage, she was moved nearly to tears on the stage. And for me that really, really brings to the fore how simple it can be, how effective it can be, how powerful it can be, 
and bringing people closer to what we're doing. And so, again, so thank you to Giles. I'd like to hand over now, please, to Amanda, um, who's going to talk about um, sort of the legacy and moving forwards. Hello. Hello. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank Ken and Giles. And Giles talked about transforming fundraising. I think Ken and Giles have probably already transformed fundraising because for the whole of their professional lives they've done nothing but urge us to get better at fundraising and to talk to our donors and to say thank you. So this is the combination of, um, hopefully not just the final combination, of, of a life's work. So thank you to both of you. Um, I think that this work is um, amazing and I think it's co probably coming home now to the Institute. I think it's the right place for it to be. Uh, I think, it, uh, well, I, will, I promise that we will make sure it's in, in good hands and we look after it for you. It's been an extraordinary initiative, um, a decade of voluntary work, volunteer time put into it. So thank you for that. Um, it was two years ago at convention that the idea was first mooted and discussed, I think, with Peter and Richard, Peter Lewis and Richard Taylor. So fantastic that we are coming full circle and talking about it at this launch today. So, the Institute is delighted to take over leading on the legacy of, of this important work and we are absolutely committed to ensuring that the outputs last, are promoted and are continually updated. So we've already written to the Chief Executives of Akivo and NCBO to help us to steer the future legacy of the Commission by setting up an advisory board, an advisory panel, we're delighted that Giles, in his role as an IOF trustee, will keep a leading role in driving the work forward. And we're making three additional commitments today. We're not going to lose the enthusiasm of the hundreds of volunteers who've taken this work forward, who've spent so much time on it, and we'll be forming a new special interest group in order to be able to do that. We're going to appoint a representative of the ongoing work to our standards advisory board so that it informs our work on standards in the future and there will be a new award at the award ceremony next year for the charity that provides the very best donor experience in 2018 and going into the future. So finally, huge thank you to everybody involved in this, to you for being here today, to Ken, to Richard, to Giles for all the work that's, got, work that's gone into it and to the volunteers and I want to say welcome home to the Commission for the Donor Experience and we promise to look after it well.